Good evening, and welcome to another lecture in the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty's Perspectives on Economic Liberty series. The Center for the Study of Economic Liberty is a joint endeavor of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and, and Leadership and the W.P. Carey School of Business. I en encourage students to find this evening's focus interesting, to examine the range of courses that Skettle offers in leadership and entrepreneurship, as well as my own course on philosophy, politics, and economics. I'm always happy to flog my own courses, um, since I'm the one at the front. The, um, the Center's Perspectives Lecture Series emerges from its mission, which is to evaluate the contribution of economic liberty to human flourishing. One of the ways to fulfill that mission is to invite a variety of guests who will examine the topic of the center and consider its relationship to other values and freedoms that we may hold, and also its contribution to human betterment. Our guest speaker this evening is Magat Wade, a serial entrepreneur whose passion and products are grounded in her Senegalese heritage. You may have seen her in the movie Poverty, Inc., or you can also find her um, on TEDx at a TEDx um, uh, film from the UFM in uh, Guatemala, um, TEDx. Her goal is cultural innovation. Her products from Adina Beverages to Tissan and now Skin is Skin are aimed at being cultural disruptors. Please welcome Magat Wade to ASU. Hello. Thank you, Ross. Oh, it's OK. I can do it. Thank you. Good evening, and thanks for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, first, I wanted to thank our host, Russ, Emmett, and Kim, and also Mason Hunt for all of your hard work. I know it's been a long three days, but um, you know I really appreciate the work of the um, Center for the Study of Economic Liberty, because to me, economic liberty is personal. And I will share with you why. As an African, it's very personal. Um, you see, I was born in Senegal, the west coast of Africa. Then my family moved to Germany. Then we moved to France. And uh, I can remember, from the time I can remember first arriving in Germany, one question hit me and hit me right away and almost never left me until I found a solution. And it was this very simple question as to why is it that, you know, the place that I just came from, meaning this one place back home in Senegal, was so different in terms of uh, development from this place I just got into in Germany. Why did it feel like uh, Germany has plenty of roads, plenty of buildings, plenty of, you know, running, you know, people had access to all types of convenience, and back home it was not the same. That was a question for me as a seven and a half uh, year old little girl. I was just like, this, this whole thing makes no sense. Why is it, why is this, why do we have this big difference? And it's a question that never left me, you know, it never left me. And along the journey, I would have people, you know, come up with all types of reasons as to why my continent, most of my continent, uh, has not accomplished the level of prosperity that it should have achieved, given that we are the richest continent in the world in terms of what we have under the ground. And actually today you could also argue we have one of the youngest populations in the world, that also is wealth. Right? It's richness, uh, youth is. So how come we have all of this, yet my people, our people, are not, are not um, accomplishing the level of prosperity that they should be um, accomplishing? Why do we still have some women walking miles and miles every single day for hours going to fetch water and then you know, have to cook in stoves that are highly polluting for themselves, their families, and the environment? Why? Why did we have this disparity? And so um, as I started, uh, you know, I went on with my life. And it's a question that never left me, like I said. And along the way, I found many people, you know, all types of people had all types of answers as to why this place had prosperity, that other place had poverty. Some people, flat out, will tell you, oh, of course, you know, Africans have low IQ. Seriously, some people don't say it, but they don't think any differently than that. Yeah, low IQ. Others, oh, you know, uh, because they're malnourished. Others, because they don't have access to healthcare or, you know, all the diseases. Others, 
Oh, it's because, you know, all of these wars that they came out of. Others, oh, it's because it was colonialism. Others, oh, imperialism. Others, oh, it's because, you know, they don't have access to, um, to clean water. I mean, name it. Everybody around town is coming up with their own reasons as to why we're poor. For Christ's sake, I even have some people bringing me shoes because they think that if I get shoes, I will no longer be poor. It's all over the place. This is a mess. So, so of course, some of that I can debunk it right away, but some of it, I did not debunk it right away. Like the whole relationship between colonialism, for example, and where we are today, it took me a while to, to really understand what happened and to which degree, you know, it was part of a problem. And so I won't go into those today, but most importantly, what you have to understand is as of now, I'm standing here and I come from a country, again, Senegal, uh, where I have most of my um, young people, especially, are, we have this phenomenon where they pack themselves into little fishermen's boats and try to get to Europe to find a job, right? So um, most of them don't make it. It's a very, very perilous journey. We have families taking you know, the journey. Babies are in these boats. And oftentimes, on a regular basis, you hear a boat that did not make it. Sometimes you hear about uh, a plane, you know, a body that just fell off from a plane somewhere above England on its way to Europe. Somebody tried to hide in some parts of a plane to make it um, you know, to Europe illegally, and of course, you know, uh, hid in the wrong place of a plane. Sometimes they open the plane and the body is frozen in the cargo section because they didn't know that once you're up there, you know, the temperature drops at such level that no human can survive in there. So, you know, and then others, they say, oh, the, 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 the sea route is so dangerous, we're gonna try to take a land route, right? And so they take the land route and most of them get stuck in Libya. And so what happens in Libya right now? Well, people like me, we're being sold between $300 and $500 as slaves in 2019. We knew this, but you know, it took for CNN to talk about it and to finally show it for the rest of the world to A, know about it, and B, even believe it. But I've known about these things, because guess what? On WhatsApp, Facebook, all of that, we talk about it. You know, in my little uh, groups, all, a lot of us Africans, we kind of share this information. Some of us, I have so many friends who died at sea. I have so many friends who know friends who are struggling somewhere in Libya all the time. So I grew up with these stories. Um, so you can see how daunting the whole thing can be, right? I am one of the biggest Afro-optimists I think Earth has ever carried, but I no longer allow myself to only want to stick to the story of Africa Rise. Before we started talking about Africa Rise, I was one of the people who were just like, we need to talk about Africa Rise, you know, we need to talk about a different story about Africa. Now, though, we have gotten to a place where we only want to talk about the positives and we kind of forget that we still have an overwhelming majority of people in Africa who still live in poverty. And to me, if we only want to talk about the good, because I understand the need that we have for dignity and pride to not always be talked about in certain ways, but I do think that if we want to solve a problem, and there is a problem, we got to be honest with ourselves and we got to be honest with other people. So yes, there are some good things that are happening, and thank God, but there are still a lot, and actually I would say too many people that are just not where they should be. So the, 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 the part for tonight is about that. How can we make sure that you know, we can help lift all of these people into a place of prosperity, dignity, and pride that they so deserve as simple human beings? So um, as I started researching all of this, I started, um, something started to occur to me. At first, it was, very, it was just as simple as, you know, on one end, I have uh, people dying at sea trying to look for work in Europe. And on another end, I have part of my uh, cultural heritage dying. In this situation, what am I talking about? For example, the hibiscus drink. Uh, when I started my first company, and that's the reason why I started it, it was in uh, 2003, basically I had gone home, back home to Senegal just to discover that this hibiscus, you know, the traditional drink of Senegal that I loved so much was basically starting to disappear. And the women who used to grow the hibiscus to make the juice had, were basically losing their livelihoods. Because you know, all of us humans, we go by what we call status. Everybody always is in the game of showing status to their fellow other human being. And it's done in so many different ways. It's happening here, it happens everywhere. So the way uh, a lot of people back home signal status, so the, the elites are busy basically buying Western brands, 
Well, so in this case, they're buying Fanta, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, products like that. And then the base of a pyramid, which is where most people are, are busy buying knockoff products of a Western brands, coming usually from China, India, and places like that. Really not good quality most of the time, but it doesn't matter because you know what? You're walking around with a can of uh, you know, soda that looks almost like it's a Pepsi, and for you it gives you a sense of pride and you know, like you're in the end. So in the meantime, what's going on is our indigenous products are being squeezed out in the process, out of the middle. And that's how all of a sudden you look. It's no, for my own people, it's, no, it's not cool to be drinking uh, hibiscus drinks because it's indigenous to us. And uh, so the women who used to grow the hibiscus, you know, now losing their livelihood. So they're leaving the countryside, going to um, the city, trying to find work. A lot of them over there end up in uh, prostitution and, you know, child, children, their, with their children, begging by their side sometimes. So it's just, um, the whole thing is quite, was quite nightmarish when I got started. And the hibiscus thing was on its way out, declining, production of hibiscus. So at that moment, I, I remember, you know, wanting the hibiscus. I had just come back from the US. You know, you get so homesick for some of these products, so that's the first thing you go for, you know, all of these beverages and all of these foods that are t totally, you know, typical to you. And, you know, restaurants, my own family, home, everybody was like, girl, where have you been? You know, Basically, if, you're, if you've made it and you want to show it, you just show that, you know, you, that's the, budget, the beverages you have on, on, the, on the tray. But for me, when they bring this tray, and I see on the tray, I see Pepsi, I see Fanta, I see Coca-Cola, and others, and I do, don't see my drink. Do you see what I, do you, do you really, do you know what I see? I see that I, as an African, as a Senegalese, that my culture, does not exist, because think about it, that tray is the world. The brands on it are representing cultures that are the most, among the most respected and the most aspirational in the world. And at that moment, it really, something happened in my head. I was like, this is interesting. And at that moment, I did not realize all the things I'm talking about. I was just like, this is interesting. At, the, at that moment, what happened though, is I became ill. I basically fell ill to my stomach. For three days, my body was shut. I was so angry at my own people. I was so disappointed at the state of the world. I was so not okay. But at some point, my husband said, you know, this anger of yours, it's energy, but it's such negative energy. You've got to find a way to turn it into a positive energy when it becomes inspiration. And I think at some point, the pain was so great that I had no choice but to do something about it. And I think between the choice, between the pain and what it made me, and it making me wanna really turn it from anger to inspiration, and this old teaching that I've always gotten from my parents of criticize by creating, it's Michelangelo's, but our parents raised us by that mantra, criticize by creating, it was just like, okay, if you're not happy that this drink is disappearing, and that the women who used to grow the hibiscus are out of work right now, and that your culture is disappearing and all of that, do something about it. It doesn't have to be a good solution, but do something about it because you know what, where I come from, the only, the only uh, acceptable form of uh, criticism is an offering an alternative. So I said, okay, fine. I'm gonna come up with a drink that we're gonna build in the West. It's gonna be one of the top drinks in the West, and I'm gonna play reverse colonialism on my own people. So we're gonna make it such that the West is gonna drink it, elite, you know, elite people in the West, and by the time we get back to Africa, they're gonna be like, oh gee, we know, we've been hearing this is the stuff to drink because guess what, in, your, in, the, in the West we hear that's all they're drinking. And it's okay for that generation to behave like that because you know, we, we all have our issues, but hopefully what I'm looking at is always in the long game is the children, the next generation, will not need to wait for the West to validate anything for them because they would have been born in a world where Adina, companies like Adina, Tio San and Skinny Skin, all of that, they were born in a world where we have beautifully made African products made in Africa and sold in some of the most prestigious places around the world and for them, it's just normal. So they would be born in a world like that. So I was willing, in the meantime, to, you know, to, take, uh, to deal with whatever it was. So um, that's how I got started with my first company. Uh, I stopped counting. Uh, the goal was really to put women, uh, people back to work, especially these women. I stopped counting when we put 4,000 women back to work. And eventually, some people were like, my god, no. It, it went as high as 9,000 people. So 
Why do I, and then people ask me, because Forbes calls me the, Af the Senegalese person who sells um, African uh, um, recipes to the West. Why do I do that? Why did I go down that path? Oftentimes people ask me, why, why these type of products? And, and because consumer brands for me, I started to think about the power of consumer brands because of that tray. I didn't understand right away. But again, I think by now you can see I'm a person who, once a question is lodged in here, I have to find a, the answer. And I go look weird places. So what I do, I went and I looked at, um, and sure enough, there is a ranking of the brands, of the top brands in the world. And you, when you look at the top brands in the world, you realize that there is almost, there is actually no African brands up there. The first brand you would see after hundreds and hundreds down the line is South African Airways, which to me is hardly an African brand because it was a brand that was started under apartheid. But that's the first brand you, you, you see. Do you know who is at the top there? American brands, European brands, those, that's who is at the top. French brands, British, uh, uh, French brand, um, German ones with cars especially, and then a bunch of Italian brands, you know, that's what you see. And why am I not surprised? But, and by the way, Afri American brands top the list. They really are winning everywhere. Then, why do you think, why would you wonder that every time I go anywhere around the world, and God knows I travel, I go to Saudi Arabia, I go to all over the place, and everywhere I go, I, a little bit of my um, little, um, it's my thing to ask a young person, sometimes it's my young driver, whatever it is, and I ask that person, where do you want to go in the world? Outside of America, most of the people, young people I talk to, almost, almost for sure, any given time, it's somewhere in America that they want to go to. Always, almost. And the next uh, destination is somewhere in Europe, usually France or Italy. Put that in touch with the brands I told you about that were the most um, at the top of that list of the top brands in the world, which nationalities they were representing. But it makes sense. It made sense. Because with Disney movies that are distributed everywhere, so many of us think there is this, and it's all aspirational, isn't it? Coca-Cola, all aspirational, isn't it? They're selling you this culture that everybody wants to be part of, right? Um, even Facebook, you may think of it as a technology company, but it is a brand. Google, same thing. There are many search engines that you could be using. It's not just because Google is the best, supposedly, but there is a brand, there's all of it. A brand is always pushing something. It's always pushing a certain culture. So America is fantastic at branding, and it has done such a great job at it that people who have a ch people who to whom you're saying, if I could give you any passport, where would you want to go? They tell you, I want to go to America. And then when you come to America and you ask the young Americans, where do you want to go? Pay attention next time. It's probably going to be somewhere in Europe, France, Italy, somewhere in Europe. Just try when you get out of these doors. And again, it goes back to brands. So the reason why I decided to start uh, consumer brands is because insofar as I was really upset about my culture at you know, being at the uh, some cultural aspects of my identity disappearing, it became important for me to build, uh, to, I wanted to rely on the power of brands to actually use it as a vehicle, as a vessel to push my brand out to the world and to make sure that it kind of expand in a way. Because anything that doesn't expand is doomed to die. And I certainly do not want to see myself being reminded only one day through museums. Because that's where things that have died end up at, if the world still wants to remember them. So consumer brands for that reason of really finding it as a way to push my brand out as I build into the DNA of these companies what it is to be me and my roots. And on the other hand, as companies like that thrive, we are able to put people to work. And like I said, that's what we did. We put all of these people back to work. So that's my little recipe for what am I doing about trying to bring some prosperity to Africa. Obviously, me alone doing this is not going to change a lot. We need a critical mass of us doing this. So when I started that company back in 2003, we were the first, I, we actually, to this day, we are the first, Afri the first African brand started by an African person that has accomplished so much in a way of a company. 
anywhere from how many people we got back to work back home to how much money we were able to raise, more than $32 million that we raised, a company that I started in my kitchen. Eventually, you turn around on the board of directors, you see Roger Enrico, former chairman of uh, PepsiCo. You see the founder of Odwala, who sold it to Coca-Cola for $181 million, founder of Sobe, who sold it to um, Pepsi for 300 something million dollars, and the number two of Pete's Coffee. I mean, the who's who of a beverage world basically has come and worked for us. And so that's my recipe. And then I went on to do that with cosmetics. The second company we have, Chiosan, basically at Nordstrom. The last one, Skinny Skin, we got approved. Um, we basically got picked up by Whole Foods a few months ago, and it started, it's gonna to start to roll out on, on stores starting next month. So by now, we, we think we have a way to do this, that we, because what it is, you, I really understand what's going on in the West and what the market is like here, and also we're able to build a supply chain back home. So at first, I obviously started with just the supply chain. We were gonna do you know, mostly raw material, but we were, you know, it was a supply chain of raw material prim primarily, and then, um, with my other companies, I started becoming a little bit more ambitious because I'm like, I really want for people to move up the um, supply chain, in terms of the supply chain. I wanted to make sure that we can break what I call this thatch roof ceiling. This idea that people think that the best that an African woman can do back home is to be somebody's gonna collect the shea butter for you. She can do that and more. So I wanted her not only to be able to do that, but I wanted for us to be able to transform these products and to process them on the ground. So we went on to build a really great looking lab and very efficient lab in the middle of nowhere when most people once again were saying, there's no way you guys can do this. Because they're like, people are not trained well enough. It's in the middle of nowhere. How are you gonna get all of this to work? But you know what we do? We move in without hubris. I understand we're moving into a terrain that's, very, that's not as easy as any type of difficulty you can think of multiplied by a million if you want to, for, to, for anything you want to do uh, on the ground. And we'll talk about how we're going to get that better. But anyway, so we built the lab and um, we just proceeded to basically train women who will tell you, there's a movie out there on YouTube, it's called Made in Meke, and it will show you a little bit more of the back scenes of our life back in Senegal and the lab and the people working there and everything they have to say about it. And people who will tell you, I never would have thought in a million years that I would be working in a lab where I am measuring numbers, where I am recording stuff, and where it's gonna go to, to be analyzed and all of that stuff. They didn't think that they could do work that was so technical and work that was so scientific, they didn't think they could because no one trusts us with any of that stuff, by the way. So with the companies we have now, that's, we raise the bar a little bit higher. So I am no longer happy with companies that are here and just saying, oh yeah, we're buying our raw materials from Africa. I think that's great. And can you challenge yourself to maybe produce in Africa? And because again, I don't like to sit there and tell people what to do, I offer myself as an example. We did it, come on, do it. When we, when we started Adina, no one thought this could be done. The, a, a beverage company by an African could succeed anywhere. They all said, even my friends, black friends of mine, African friends of mine who were going to Harvard and everything, laughing at me saying, oh girl, you know, you have all of this education just so you can go and start a flower juice company? Because that's how our people used to think back then. But since then, guess what? We have so many people around trying to create African brands, and I'm so happy. So it works. We, we just are gonna keep pushing people to think harder and to do more and to challenge themselves more. So now I want as many of them to start producing this stuff in Africa. I'm no longer just excited because you're gonna tell me, oh, I'm buying the raw material. So that's what we have done. And in the meantime, going back to my question, why are some countries poor, like mine, and why are other countries rich? So as I'm doing business now, between Senegal and the US, I'm starting to notice something. I'm starting to notice that, I'll give you an example. If you want to start an LLC here in this country, so you're basically going to register your business. That's why you're doing this. You want to make sure your business is legit. So you want to start an LLC, you go online, it takes you 15 minutes or less, depending on how fast you type, and boom, you're done you're gonna get 
quickly back from the state of where, wherever you're filing, you're going to get all of your uh, papers of incorporation with a signature of uh, the Secretary of State. Everything is good, you're legal, you're good to go. Then you can email directly your bank all the papers of incorporation that you just have received with a new EIN that you got online from the IRS, and boom, you have a bank account. Done. Done. This is less than half an hour of your time because everything else is happening, people are getting back to you, that's all. And it cost you what, maybe 50 bucks? Now, compare that. You're in Senegal. It takes you up to a year of your time and up to, up to a year of your salary to register the business, the same type of business that you just registered in the US. Are you starting to see the difference that I'm talking about? Right? Okay. Why are some countries poor? and some other countries rich. These young people who are leaving my, my country, packing themselves into little fishermen's boats, not being able to make it to Europe because a boat tips over somewhere over the Mediterranean, and they're right now lying at the bottom of the ocean serving as fish food. That person left his country or her country because they are too poor where they are and they cannot stay, they are gonna go look for work. Why? You're poor because you have no money, at least not enough money to take care of your basic needs. You have no money because you have no source of income. Where does a source of income co come from for most of us? It comes from a job, right? Anybody here who disagrees, please raise your hand. I would love to have a conversation. So I think we all agree because I see no hands up. A source of income for most of us is a job. Where do jobs come from? They come from businesses, right? especially from small and medium-sized enterprises. And for anybody in the room who's thinking in their mind, because trust me, I give lectures a little bit everywhere and I still have in some places, people telling me, oh no, jobs come from government. But even when you work from the for the government, I would like to think that you're gonna get paid, right? Where do you think that money that the government uses to pay you is coming from? It's coming from the taxes that employees and employers are paying. So once again, we're back to the private sector. You wanna, you're working for an NGO, for a nonprofit? Where do you think that money comes from? Somewhere along the line, someone has worked really hard and turned around and given money to that NGO. So once again, that money was produced somewhere. And it was produced in the private sector, was produced with companies, with businesses. And most importantly, within, when you look at all the type of businesses, sizes, we know that the bulk of jobs, new jobs created, come from small and medium-sized enterprises. We call them SMEs. So if indeed this poverty issue we're talking about will be solved by people having jobs and the income that comes from it, from it um, comes from small and medium-sized enterprises mostly, businesses in general, then don't you think that it would make sense to start to think about the environment in which these businesses are supposed to exist in? Don't you think? If I want to plant, or if I want to plant a tomato and get really nice juicy tomatoes, and I leave, it, it doesn't matter where you live, but the first thing I do, because I like to garden, to, Michael feels like I'm a bad gardener because I never take care of my plants, but the first thing I do is I go to the nursery. Because I really wanna make sure that I'm picking the best plant for my environment, because those two belong together. It's not enough to be a good seed. You have to be in a good, fertile soil an environment for that seed to grow at its maximum potential and its best and be blossom in a way that, you know, at its maximum. Well, there again, there are indexes in the world that measure how hard or easy it is to start and run a business anywhere in the world. I usually use the Doing Business Index ranking of the World Bank and the Economic Freedom Index of the Fraser Institute and systematically, systematically, it is embarrassing, but it, it, ma it uh, matches what I have seen myself on, you know, in my real life. All, almost all Sub-Saharan African countries except for five are pretty much at the bottom of that list. It is harder to do business anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa than it is anywhere in Scandinavia. Think about that for a second, I'll repeat myself. For those, you know, people are out there talking about, ah, oh, yeah, Scandinavia is such a great, you know, like um, social democrat 
countries, and even them, by the way, saying, we're not socialist countries. We're, you know, even in those countries, it is hard, easier to do business anywhere in those places than it is anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa. Turns out, Africans and would-be local African entrepreneurs are chained at the neck. We are lacking the most basic economic freedom. What do I mean by economic freedom? Because you know, you put these words out there. What I have learned by now is that a lot of people have no idea what you talk about. Even when I tell them it is easier to do business in uh, Scandinavia than it is in Africa, they look at you and they're like, you know, the, I think their minds are looking at it. And it just occurred to me a few months ago that I was been talking to a friend of mine for years and I thought she understood what I was talking about. She seemed to agree with me. But then one day she went in and she was, she finally sp spilled it out and she was like, well, you know, uh, you know, you have to understand every time I hear about deregulation, well, I'm thinking that somebody's trying to talk to me about laissez-faire, and I'm very worried about laissez-faire, I don't believe in laissez-faire, and blah, blah, blah. That's a debate for another day, laissez-faire, no laissez-faire. Here I'm talking about, can you just get me to the level of economic freedom that Scandinavian countries have? Because even at that level, I'll do much better than what I'm doing right now. And then we can talk about the next, part, the next phase of it, how much, uh, you know, how much capitalism or not do we get? So what does it mean in reality? I'll walk you through a few hurdles. You heard about how long it takes to register your business? Compare that to the US. Another, another one is, you see, um, f you can imagine that in order to compete in the world that I compete in, <laughs> I think a lot of you have gone to Whole Foods, right? You know that you don't find crappy products at Whole Foods, right? They are very, very picky and very demanding as they should be. So, Therefore, you can understand that I can't just afford to produce in just any way I want. Buy a product here one day here, buy my ingredients another day here. I have to have very rigorous standards and super high standards, especially given that we have subjected ourselves to even higher standards than the US re requires when it comes to cosmetics. Because quite frankly, I'm not happy with the uh, standards of US cosmetics. I do think they're still using a lot of crappy ingredients that I would not put on my skin, I would never put on somebody else's skin. And I also think the way I wanna do my labeling, of course I don't want the state to have to tell me what to do, but I take it upon myself to, wanna, to make sure that I disclose every single ingredient that's in our product, including some of these components that you find in essential oils. We, we use essential oils, but there are things like linalolin and things like that, that you should normally should be putting on your label, because people should know. Our American competitors don't because the law doesn't force them to do that. And again, I'm not about the law telling you what to do. I am about companies competing because they're the most transparent ones and they win with customers because, you know, they're transparent. So we, so you can understand that it's, 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 it's a big, it's a big no-no for me to just buy from anyone at any standard. Our standards are very high. So because of that, there are only two companies that match my requirement in Senegal for the seven ingredients that I need from the latest product, the lip balm. Only two. The rest, I have to import. Because if I tell myself, you're not gonna import those ingredients, so it means I have to mess with my formulation and not be able to really get the best formulation possible. And I can't do that. So I have to bring this product in, and it's normal. We, believe, we live in a global world, you import what you don't have, you mix it up, and then you send it back. So, means I have five ingredients that I'm left with. Out of those five ingredients, three of them come I, when I bring it in, and out of those three, one, you can't even find it in Senegal. Forget like the good quality or not, it's not even in our country. So I have to bring it in. Do you know how much they charge me when it hits uh, customs? 45%, a 45% tariff on that ingredient when it hits um, customs. And you have to understand that for every 50 cents of raw material that I put in my product in, in the ways of COGS, cost of goods sold, that 50 cents is gonna translate into a $2 added to, my, um, to, your, to your price as a customer. So imagine, compare me now. Let's say I had a competitor who is in the US or who is in a country where they don't have that 45%, maybe it's 0% or maybe it's 3%. And me, because we have these laws that says 45%, and by the way, the other two, 70%. So because I have this law, now imagine, I am, you are making a product just like mine, but you're based in the US, you get all of your ingredients, you don't have to worry about anything I worry about. 
I am operating from Senegal, and then you and me, we're going to show up at Whole Foods, and we're going to try to sell to a customer. The same product, same ingredients. I'm just using the same things for the sake of comparison. Let's say one costs one dollar, the other one has to cost three dollars because you arbitrarily added 50 cents to it. Same product, same quality, same everything. Where do you think a customer, which one do you think a customer is going to buy? Mine from Senegal costing three dollars or yours from America costing one dollar? Yours from America costing one dollar. You rendered me non-competitive. Another example, the doing business uh, measures access to uh, electricity, for example. There, well, you know, uh, when we built our lab, we had to pull up the electricity in there. Eventually, in, um, not only you go, you apply for everything and you wait for months, and then you don't see anything happening. Your assistant keeps going back and forth and she comes back and nothing is happening. And then you go over there and you ask, um, you finally go to the agency and you see, we try to see the manager. And at some point he sees you and he's like, lady, look on my table over there. Do you see that pile of paper? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, that pile of paper, it's, each one of them is a single application. And for each of these applications, we need a meter. Look over here, the meters, that's what we have. I look over the, so this application, I'm seeing maybe 200, 300 application. And then he says, look at the meters. I'm seeing three meters. And my application is somewhere in there. I'm never going to get my electricity, never. I got to do something. What? But, got, but I got to do something for most people is I'm going to pay. Bribe. I'm not, I'm not going to pay a bribe because I don't believe in bribes. So I just sit there and I do what I do best. I talk this man's ears out. He's like, oh my god, if I do not do something, she's never going to leave me alone. So he's like, OK, just take one. And so we got our, but now I'm like, OK, I have this meter. But what am I going to do with it? Because Normally, I had already paid the technician, but they're like, you have to hire one of the technicians we use. So I already paid the technician for my application, remember. But now I have to hire the same technician from the side for him to come over. So they come and they're like, oh, well, the cable doesn't have to be so long. We need a pickup truck to put the roll on, the roll of cable on, to move it around. And uh, the truck we have, there's only one, and it's like in this one of a town, and we don't know when we're going to get it. I know, again, if I just wait, I might be here next year. So I'm like, OK, I go to the mayor of the town, I get um, a tr pickup truck from him from the city. Then they're like, oh, but we don't have a ladder. So I go back to the mayor and I get a ladder. This whole thing takes us probably a week more to take care of. And then finally, we loan them a ladder, and it took them a week more to bring the ladder back because they use it to go do some more work on our backs. So you see, you're here. You need a new service for electricity set up anywhere. How long does it take you guys usually? Does it really take you the months that it took me between us waiting and then me by, but by me moving and sh shaking everybody up, we got it done within a few weeks. But really, does it take a few weeks even? And another one is labor laws. If I want to hire Michael for, to be one of uh, the people who works in the lab, well, he, if he has a PhD in English literature, something I have absolutely no use for. But you know what? That's what he has. And he's sitting home doing nothing, but I have seen that I could hire him for what I need. And he wants to work for us. At the price we can afford, we agreed on the price, it's going to be the contract. Guess what? Not so easy, folks. Because the state of Senegal has conventions for every line of work, for every industry, the state of Senegal has a convention with that industry. And within the convention, it says, if you're going to hire somebody for this line of work, and that person has this degree, and you're going to hire them at this title, even the title at which you hire them is going to make a difference. Hire them at this title, and they have had this many years of experience, then you have to pay them between this and this. I don't care that he has a PhD in, in, in literature, but the fact that he has a PhD in literature is going to make him cost a fortune for me. So what do I do? I don't hire him. Now, you're basically screwed because of your degree. Your degree makes it that nobody's going to touch you. See there, compare that in the US at will employment. We meet, we agree on something, sign a contract. If you don't like it, two weeks notice. If I need to get rid of you, I give you two weeks notice. If you need to leave, you give me two weeks notice. 
Freedom, go, buy. If for whatever reason I lose 80% of my business overnight, I can adapt. I can let go of a few people, put a few of them more on part-time until I make it and bring people back. Because guess what? When I hear people complaining about labor laws and saying, oh, well, we need to protect the, the you know, we need to protect the employees be because employers are, really, do you think that our only thing there, especially as a small and medium-sized business, that our only thing is to try and fire employees every day we wake up? Do you know how much it costs us to train somebody? And if the person is working out just fine, really, I mean, in which world do you think we are? But I'm sort of wake up and let go of you and start over all over again. Makes no sense. So this idea that most of us employers are, you know, POS, I'm trying to not use bad words, I mean, it's insane. And guess what? Senegal has one of the most protected workers in the world. We have the most protected employees in the world on paper. And guess what? That's why we have one of the highest unemployment in the world as well, because if I hire you and you tell me I can't fire. If, if you were to marry whomever you want to marry, and I tell you, wait a second, if you need or want to divorce them for whatever reason you can't, will you marry that person in the first place? I usually get a no. It doesn't matter how much you love that person. I am not going to be like <laughs> tied to anybody. So same thing. If I can't fire you, I can't hire you. It is that simple. It may sound crude or harsh, but it is a simple truth. And especially as a company, you need to have a flexibility to move around and to do what you need to do because things will happen that oftentimes are out of your control. You're gonna have employees that worked out very well for a few years and all of a sudden we don't know what's going on or whatever, separation needs to happen. And if you're telling me that I'm stuck or worse yet, that I have to seek the approval of a government, we've got a problem. See, all of these things that I talked about, guys, is what we call economic freedom. When you're in the US and you can hire somebody at will and it's gonna take 15 day, two weeks notice, compare that to me who has to go to the government seek approval to let go of anybody, compare that to me who has to be told by the government how much to pay this person and all that, you can see how a person in America has more freedom, That's, and we call it economic freedom because it has to go about economics, that person has more freedom than me. Compare that to what's going on with electric access to electricity. Those are also part of what we, call, we include in, ex, in economic freedom. You can see how in America you have greater economic freedom than I do. When I talk to you about the tariffs that we have, in the US they put zero, sometimes two or three percent on, on most of these. Mine is 45%. You see how you have more economic freedom in the US than you have for me. And so on and so forth. And it continues and continues and continues. And that, my friends, is a reason why Africa mostly is poor. Most of Africa is poor. Most of Africa is poor because Africans do not get to enjoy a baseline of economic freedom that's needed to unleash its, its local and indigenous entrepreneurs. So people in the diaspora are like, I'm not going over there to mess with this stuff. I'm not going over there. I'm gonna make my money here. I'm gonna send some remittance money back home. And they use the money usually to consume. So they're not even investing, but to consume or build a home. That doesn't make money. That's not an investment. You're consuming. So that's why we're poor. But the story of that, the story of the simple fact that we are poor because we do not get to enjoy the same economic freedom, our entrepreneurs do not enjoy the same entrepreneur's toolkit that the rest of the world, the rich world, enjoys, which is rule of law, secure and transferable property rights, economic freedom, and free markets, we don't have that. We think Africa is free, we're not free. We're not free. And the worst is, most people don't see this. And they don't see this thanks to what? Thanks to this horrible, horrible bias that most people have on something we call capitalism. Because this ability to, to do free enterprise, free, and the key word here, guys, is free. The freedom to trade with one another the freedom to enter into a contract with one another. You're my employee, I'm gonna be your boss. The freedom to, for, that we have to, in that contract to say, I'm gonna pay you X, you say, yes, I, I will go do that. That's what the Africans are missing. And no one knows about it. The world is against what Africa needs. When I hear people, some young people being all excited about something they call socialism, I worry. I worry. I need more freedom, not less. I need less government telling me what to do, not more. So if we've listened to these people, do you know who stands to suffer the most? 
us Africans. I think it's, you know, okay, it's dangerous still for them, but they're not gonna see the results of this probably for another generation or so after it really has made its effect. But for some young person here who enjoys everything that, you know, prosperity can offer, they sit in these AC rooms with all the comfort, seats, everything, great teachers, all of that, that you have enjoyed because actually you people were free to enterprise and now you're gonna sit there because of some misunderstanding that you have of what it is to do trade. You're gonna sit there and try to promote things that are actually gonna condemn me to never, ever make it to a certain level of prosperity, dignity, and pride. And I say no. So these people out there calling for socialism have something else coming their way. If they think it's a fight that they have within America, oh no, 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 no. Because those ideas winning means we're screwed, big time. And if they wanna know what it is like, soon I'm gonna tell some of them, you really think it's cool? Then you trade with me. And if you don't wanna trade, then shut up and move away. This is real, guys. My friends, real people are dying. And in other parts of the world, war are happening because when people have no jobs, there's nothing more dangerous than a young person, especially a young man who has no hope in life. A young person who thinks it doesn't matter. I'm gonna take a few people down with me on my way to blowing myself up because that's how angry I am at the world. I have hundreds of thousands of young people all over Africa that if this continues, we have ticking bombs walking all over the place. And if you think because you're thousands of miles away in America that you're gonna be immune to this, think again. So we have so many reasons to really get our act together, to set the record straight. Because you know, sometimes I walk into rooms of people who are, so many people who wanna do something about, um, you know, Africa, oh, we wanna help and all of that stuff. And then a room full of people Hundreds of people, you ask who knew that the reason Africa is poor is because we lack, its entrepreneurs lack uh, economic freedom. A few hands will go up, as in three, four, five, maybe if you're lucky, it doesn't matter how big the number is. And that is a problem. Meanwhile, people thinking that the problem is because, oh, I don't have access to shoes, so I'm gonna bring you shoes, so you're no longer poor. Uh, you don't have access to clean water, so I'm gonna give you clean water, because, so you're no longer poor. By the way, do not take me wrong. I have absolutely nothing against humanitarian aid. And I have absolutely nothing against feeding someone or giving water to someone who needs it right now. But what I have a problem is when everybody involved with working on Africa is working on that short-term solution of giving you the fish right now to feed you. Everybody is working on giving the fish. Who is working with me on working on the mid to long-term solutions that are gonna get us to the place where I no longer need your fish, thank you very much. What are we? I mean, do you really think we wanna spend the rest of our lives you know, being the recipients of whatever the world is willing to give us? That's the problem. People don't know what the hell is going on. And then you have a media out there that is so biased against what we need, which is more business. And I have Hollywood out there that's so biased against also what it needs, business. And I have academia that's so against us, not you guys, Ross and people, but most of the people around you. This is insane. And us, we're there, and we're just at the mercy of all of these things happening. And then they give us aid, and then this aid is just going into the hands of these people who are gonna go and buy themselves some chateaus in the south of France and all of that. So if you really wanna help, you have to really get, make, make sure that you are educated about the real diagnostic as to why Africa is poor. And then pour all of your energy on seeing how it is that each one of you can bring me more economic freedom, more rule of law, more free markets, and more um, secure and transferable property rights. Some of you will come up with solutions that have to do with e-governance to help with transpar greater transparency, less corruption. Some of you will come up with maybe helping build amazing campaign. If the charity water people, for example, I give them one thing, they are amazing at marketing. 
if charity water kind of canalize that ability and that talent that they have for marketing, for communicating hard messages into easy to understand messages. If they use that, not to tell the world that poverty will be, clean, will be solved by providing people with clean water, but poverty will be solved by providing people with the entrepreneur's toolkit that we talked about, that's what I would love to see from Charity Water. Bring your talent for marketing and message building to help me get that message more out there so we can counter the bias that actually media, academia, and Hollywood have against what I need back home. Right? Tom Shoes, you want to help. OK, fine. But you, you know, you want to do it through shoes. But instead of dumping your free shoes on me and putting out of work multiple people who are making shoes, thank you very much, like in the village we are, we have close to 2,000 people who are involved in the shoemaking industry. It's a 230 something, you know, little businesses, mom and pop, each one of them hiring 15 people, that the day the truck of Tom Shoes shows up with its free shoes, these people are out of work because who can compete against free? So Tom Shoes, if you wanted to help, one thing you can do is maybe Take the shoes, uh, take uh, the proceeds, some of the proceeds you make, like those pairs of shoes that cost you five bucks to make, because that's what the, that's what the pair of shoes cost. Because they don't give us the fancy shoes that you bought. They, they give us like a $5 pair of shoes that we fit. And all the kids in Africa know that, by the way, because they'll tell you, oh, this is, kids, by the way, don't even want them anymore. Because they're like, this stuff is bad quality. No, seriously, within two weeks, especially the right, I know it is because my sister kid told me. He's like, yeah, the, the, the right toe, I don't know why the right toe, a hole. Kids are like, I don't want this stuff. So, but even if they took that $5 that they're paying to get that shoe made, and they pile it all up, it's a check. It's $10,000, it's a million dollars, it's whatever. And they say, we want to provide some shoes to some kids in, Af in, in Africa. Fine, but maybe what if you came to these small businesses and you passed a contract with them? You told them, here's a million bu bucks, I'm spending, I'm, uh, I have a contract, you know, I have an, inv uh, an invoice with you of $250,000, you $50,000, depending on the size or whatever, guess what? The shoes are gonna get to the kids, and most importantly, you're also probably growing. Now, instead of 2,000 people being employed, maybe we're gonna get to 5,000 people, 10,000 people. It is still temporary as far as I'm concerned, but at least it's not gonna hurt the way it is hurting. So here you go from growing the pool of employees from 2,000 to maybe 5,000, and, and, and on the other end, you have the way they're doing it right now, where you go from 2,000 employees to zero employees. Now you kill jobs. You see how you, we need to start thinking differently about these things. But I do think that you cannot start to think about things properly if you do not have a right diagnostic. And this is the biggest problem we have today. So when I ask, when people are like, oh, what can we do? And I say, awareness. And then they're like, oh. But guys, when have you ever come up with a good solution if, when you had the wrong diagnosis? When? So this idea, what I'm talking about of awareness, you walk into this room, I tell you this, and now you're like, oh my god, yeah, great. And now you're all excited, like, what can I do? And I tell you, help me raise awareness, and you're like, huh. no, no, huh. because when you walked in, you don't know this. And you're going to walk out, you're going to know this, hopefully. You're going to walk out of these doors, most people out there are the way you were when you walked in. They didn't know anything about this. Nothing. So, but if you start to know, then like I said, some of you will start now to think about solutions that are going to be properly oriented. And surely enough, surely enough, there is wisdom in the crowd. I want to tap into the wisdom of a crowd. And the wisdom of a crowd only manifests when the crowd knows. So I want each single person to know this proper diagnosis of why Africa is poor. And then, and then only, people will start working on solutions that I think are going to be better adapted to the situation. And they're going to work on bringing real solutions and not solutions to symptoms. Because no access to clean water is a symptom of poverty. You have access to no clean water because you're poor. Same thing with malnutrition. Same thing with even the education we're talking about has to do with that. If you don't have enough money to send your kids to school, they don't get education. And then don't turn around and tell me you don't have a job because you don't have education. Do you know how many PhDs I have in Senegal walking the streets of Dakar with no jobs? So. I'm not saying that education is not important, but I'm just trying to make sure that we get our facts straight. And we stop thinking about Africans as like these weirdo aliens that surely cannot, are not, um, everywhere you look, the path from poverty, you know, America was as poor at some point. Korea, South Korea, China, all of that, they were as poor as we were. 
especially those last two ones. Look at them today. And they did nothing more than what we talked about. They brought more economic freedom to their people. Even communist China. China created special economic zones that are known to be radically free markets. Thank you very much, in Ch communist China. Even them knew we're not going to make it if we're not going to bring free market in here. And that's how they did it. So I want to leave you with one thing. Um, a little over a year ago, right after we finished building the lab, and we were you know, about, and we had finished training everybody uh, on the production and everything, this lady, uh, you know, I sat my whole team because I was going to be on my way now back to the U.S. because, you know, I have to be back in the U.S. to kind of, you know, deal with the sales and all of that stuff, you know. Over there we produce, over here we sell, and we design, and we do all of these things, so I had to come back to this side of the waters in the team. But before leaving, it was the first time that I had sat my team down because it's a brand new team, because it's a brand new, you know, company and product line. And I proceeded to talk to them about everything that I shared with you because I think it's important. Anybody that has to be in my life has to understand my life's purpose, which is what I just talked to you about, why I do what I do, and where does my radical optimism come from in terms of we are gonna get there. So I explained all the things I shared with you guys. This question that I had, everything. And then there's this one employee of mine, her name is Yahara, she's 26 years old, before that never had a job, same thing. If you watch Made in Meke, she's the one who is, beautiful woman, and smiling and telling, you know what, before, before my God and before this job, I thought, that my, I thought that my job and destiny in this world was to cook clean while waiting for her husband. And she's laughing, you know, she's just, yeah, that's what it is. And when I told all of this, and I finished, and I finished on a high note of how we're gonna, how we're gonna soar back, how we're gonna leapfrog, she started crying. And I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm crying because um, for all my life, up till now, every time I open a magazine, I see me, the African black girl, represented in the most pathetic way as somebody who needs help from somebody else. Every time I open a magazine, every time I watch a movie, every time I see signages, even Chino, because guess what, in some of these our countries, for example, a country like Haiti, it's not in Africa, but in Haiti, you have more, I think, uh, NGOs than you have companies. And with that, all the signs, all the signs of why you should help these poor people. So, you know, I see me with flies in the eyes, the belly looking like this. I don't know, you know, like sometimes women are look so tired, looking so tired, you know, the boobs are dangling up to here, you can maybe flip them over there. I mean, I, you know, we laugh, but it's just, you know, it's just, I mean, no one should be taken, uh, no one should be pictured um, like that. You know, no one. People have a dignity, my friend. So, but you know, you see these pictures. And then, so she said, yes, you know what? And even that, I see it every all the time. You know my second company, Tiosan, the one that's more like the Nordstrom one? So that one, it's um, purely skincare, you know, like using, you know, like Baobab, um, sorry, uh, um, black seed, all of that stuff. And we had a store in New York, in upstate New York. And then this one weekend, because sometimes on weekend I like to be there and kind of see what's going on with customers and learn a little bit and make sure I take care of people. And there we said, we, um, she, my customer finished with, uh, with me, I was done with her, and she was about to leave, and she said, you know, I'm so glad I got to meet you. And I said, well, I'm so glad I got to meet you too. And she said, because you know what, before you, I never would have equated Africa to beauty. She said her truth. Why? Why though? Because when you always see us showed like that, really? So they're showing us always looking like only God knows what. And then I'm turning around trying to tell them, oh, no, 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 you know, we, are, we know a thing about beauty because we're not always like with ashy feet and uh, looking like, uh, you know what I mean? You know what I mean. But that's the image we show of us all the time. So no one equates us even to beauty. When they, notice when they show you beauty, beauty secrets around the world. It's starting to change now because we've been challenging this as well. But for up to recently, even when I started that company, which was a few years ago, you start beauty secrets of the world, we see sec beauty secrets of all types of women around the world, but you don't see an African one. As if we have nothing to show the world or to teach the world when it comes to beauty. And, it, and I say it's directly linked to all of this crap. So she said, 
my whole life, I look at magazines, I watch movies, I see these signages everywhere I look. I'm always shown as this pathetic person who cannot take care of herself, and they have to bring me shoes, they have to bring me secondhand clothing, they have to bring me food, they have to do this, they have to do that, and I have come to believe. By now, she said, I have come to believe that maybe us Africans are inferior. How many of them are walking around feeling this way? Whether they admit it or not. What a horrible, horrible way. And I was like, Whoa. my heart just sank. And then she said, but that's not why I'm crying. I said, why are you crying then? And then she said, because now I know that it is not true. And when she said that, ah, her body language, the body language that one has when one no longer feels that one is the problem. It's, it was beautiful. And if nothing else, the truth has to be told so that no longer people do think that they are the problem, because she's not the problem. It is the soil in which we have put her that's the problem. Mohammed Yunus, a Nobel Prize in economics, said, poor people are like bonsai people. It's the same seed. That seed of that little bond is the same one that you, that, that the one of a long, tall, beautiful tree in the, in the jungle. But if you take the seed, you put it in a tiny pot, it grows to this. If you take the same seed and you put it into this beautiful soil with everything that it needs, watered, everything that it needs, the proper amount of sun, everything grows to be the most beautiful tree in the forest. And that's what pe poor people are. We are bonsai people. So that environment, that soil needs to change. So when she understood that she was not the problem, that nothing was wrong with her as a seed. <sighs> and the right now, I mean, it just, for her, it changed everything, everything. And I do know that the minute you make that switch in her mind, just like over here, I make the switch in your mind, you start looking for the right solution. I make a switch in her mind, she starts thinking about the right thing and she has the right attitude. It's bound to happen. And this message has left the doors. I am everywhere all the time. Others are speaking like me as well. We are going to get there. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. This has been a lifelong pursuit of mine to understand why some countries like mine are poor and others are rich. And I do think that by now I have stumbled upon what it was. Spent a lot of time, spent a lot of time with some very smart people on this. and. I have also spent a lot of time with people who don't agree with this, and usually they're not able to sustain their belief long. So I think we're onto something. Um, and if nothing else, they tried everything else and it failed. So let me try this, especially we know that everything, everywhere it was tried, it worked. So why not us? Especially given, this is the beauty of it, we, traditionally speaking, before the white man set foot in Africa, us Africans were engaged in free enterprise, us Africans had free markets. Us Africans were not indigenous people just living out of our land. No, 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 we're growing stuff, taking it to the market, selling it to other people for something else they made. We're traveling far, far, far along, trading with one another freely. The chief was not telling us what to grow, what price to sell it at, all of that stuff that some guy named Mark told us to do. He is foreign to us, not free markets. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Magat. I don't know how long we have for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Magat. We have some time for questions, and um, I have the microphone, so I'll bring it to you. So, who would like? Uh, first, I would like to start with students. If there are students in the room, we get one here. <laughs> <laughs> I am a student, but I'm, I'm not currently taking classes. Let's take a little break. I am a uh, student at the Home School of Engineering. I take technological entrepreneurship and management. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm an introvert, so please bear with me. That's OK. Um, so um, three things popped in my uh, three questions popped in my head, both uh, politically, economically, and psychologically. Um, I've been here for 15 years, since I was 14, uh, going to school, being one of the only people um, 
among my friends to go to school first, to go to college. And um, being a refugee coming here from war. Um, so one thing that I've always dealt with that I've seen at, in the society, both internationally and lo locally, um, is that uh, psychologically, how do you think we could, you know, the perception of how people see you, both as, a, uh, as an African or black or et cetera, or as, you know, as the continent, you know, what I want to notice is that it affects the person or the continent internally, psychologically, mm -hmm. you know, in the back of the mind. Mm -hmm. And it also affects how other people see you, how they've been primed to see you. So say Google, Microsoft, Apple, why they don't really produce in Africa or African countries. Why is that? Is it because we can? Of course we can, but it's just because of the perception. It may not be intentional. It's just an automatic thing in the brain that says, no, yeah. you know, we haven't seen prosperity in there, so why take a chance over there? So, mm -hmm. um, so how do you think we can overcome that, mm -hmm. that perception? Yeah. So uh, he's talking about something that maybe if you're not African, you have a hard time understanding what he may be talking about. Um, so we, we just like my, just like Yahara, you know, my team, my team member in, uh, in, Senegal, in Senegal, who feels like, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's not enough. And it's because of all of these images that they use of us all the time in movies and everything. Even when they have a movie like Blood Diamond, I mean, they're showing the same old thing. I mean, oftentimes people get excited about Lupita Nyong'o, but I'm not excited about Lupita Nyong'o. I'm very happy that she has her, uh, what do you call it, her, uh, her, her um, Caesar or whatever you want to call it. I don't follow the, you know, I'm so upset with uh, Hollywood, it's not even a joke. But you know, once again, you're just playing like the typical roles that they're fine with us having. Um, she's a beautiful you know, like actress and everything, and I think she's very talented, but I would like for us to be recognized for things that are a little bit outside of the box. But um, so everything right now, a lot of things are out there you know, pushing the same rhetoric about what it is to be African and black. I wouldn't stand here and say that I know the whole thing and how it works for African Americans per se, because I think there is a slightly different kind of, um, you know, uh, um, how things have evolved for each one of us. Some of us were back home, some of us were here. At, root, at, at the core, I think we're a family anyway, but um, we got affected in different ways along the way. But uh, when it comes to Africans, yeah, there is this image out there that we are not capable. Like I said, a lot of people think we don't have a right IQ. So what, what I do about that myself is every single day that I show up somewhere, I think it starts with you. It starts with you. It starts with you to, you are, by just being you and by excelling at whatever it is that you do, you're gonna shatter, you know, you're bound to shatter some biases. At some point the brain is, 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 is bound to just stop in its track and be like, wait a second, this doesn't sound like what I'm thinking or what I, I was told. And another thing is, that's why I do the consumer brands. I think consumer brands, if we use consumer brands and we embed in their DNA the very best of different aspects of African cultures, because there are many of them, then as all of a sudden together, we're gonna to start to look like a tapestry. But what are they all gonna have in common? They're gonna have in common excellence. They're gonna have in common aspirational uh, elements that the rest of the world is gonna be like, oh, wait, we never thought of this. We never saw this, like this woman when she came. You can be pissed off because she said, I never, I never would have thought so, and think she was racist. Or you could look around, or you could look the, at it the other way around and be like, you know what? I just busted her myth. Let me see if I can bust the myth for many more of her. So I think at some point, you cannot just bother yourself too much with what are we gonna think, but it is the job for you just to be as dazzling as you can. And just by simply being that, I sincerely think that it does things out there. But, um, and also, you know, so for me, that has been my strategy. If other people have something else that they can bring, then please, by all means, share. I'm always interested. But that has been the path that I took to try and be, because you cannot control what other people think, right? All you can do is work on yourself and try to be the best version of yourself. And then maybe, hopefully, if enough others of us do that, you know, we start to counterbalance the stereotype that they have. Because usually, when stereotype has to fight against reality, and also, you know, when they know you, they get to know you really. 
the stereotype has no chance at that level. It has to go away at some point. So just being you, and uh, I know it's, it's bothersome, but try not to also think about it too much. I know it's easier said than done, especially, you know, right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, any? Yes, we said students. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to zip over. Hi. 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 OK. I'm trying not to, I don't want to be repetitive, but um, I want to know what it looks like when you're talking to your marketing team, because I know you're trying to build a brand. And that's a big part of it, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, um, I don't know. I'm really big on marketing. I'm, in, I'm studying computer science, by the way. Um, otherwise, I don't know. I might look into marketing at some point. Well, maybe you which, can do both. Yeah. It, I mean, mm -hmm. they can go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. But. Um, um, I don't know. I always wonder if it's intentional sometimes, um, what they do subliminal, subliminally, subliminally <laughs> because companies get in trouble a lot um, for like sometimes ambiguously racist mm -hmm. messages, mm -hmm. and it's off, like it often like divide a room on whether or not that was their intent, and if that was what they were saying or what they were trying, um, or if that's. If, if the Im imagery um, was particularly like racist or whatever, um, but I don't know. Like, I, I feel like you have a marketing team for a reason, and I wonder if they're not doing their job. I'm wondering what cliches or caricatures you avoid, like the plague, or um, like what you're looking for. You absolutely cannot include. And I don't yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I try to avoid is this uh, ambiguous stuff. I think it's BS. Uh, I really do think that uh, we should transcend and move beyond a world of PC. I think there should be nothing wrong with, um, you know, first of all, it's very important to just stick to what your brand is, what do you, what do you represent, and not try to be so not pissing off anybody, but in the end, you're gonna end up pissing off everybody. So to me, it's really about going back to just being, to just trying as much as possible to replicate what you want to see in real life and what you, what's happening in real life. Right? Am I in real life with a bunch of ambiguous people? Not really all the time. Sometimes I have, sometimes not. So I really, us, we really pride ourselves in having a marketing that is as honest as possible. We are not trying to be like, it's not because we're like, oh, we have to put one black person, one yellow person, one or whatever. No, we don't believe in that stuff. Um, we, we talk about, like, you'll see for Skinny Skin, for example, so it's, uh, it's uh, the, the mission of a company is to fight bias. And so talking about bias and how, and it's all backed by science. Everything we do is backed by science, understanding the, the science of our brain, all of that stuff. So uh, everything you were talking about, you know, the minute the person sees you, the, bra the brain has already computed x plus x equals blah, 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 run or show up or whatever it is. It's already made up his decision and you didn't even open your mouth yet, right? So um, in our situation, we don't try to be like, oh, you know, we need to try to show a young person and, a, and, a, and an older person. We just try to go for what's real. And sometimes, you know, I have this when um, even my own marketing, uh, the person who leads our marketing efforts, she's a British woman and um, she's white. And so Sharon sometimes, when we have to go to a, <laughs> when we have to go to a, and to me, I was just like, our company, we have black, we have a black woman out there, we have a Guatemalan person out there, we are as diverse as diverse can be. We even have, our cat is gray, I mean, it's all over the place. So to me, it's just like, I want our company to look like the world I want to live in. Not in an artificial way. What everybody has in common in this company is just a, a sense of what we share. And that's, what, that's the type of image we want to replicate out back to the rest of the world. So I really think for me, it's like we need to try to stay away from um, um, politically correct, as far as I'm concerned. It's manufactured. Hmm? It's manufactured. It's manufactured. It's manufactured. And I would like to think that our um, customers are smarter than that. Or, or I should say, I only want to deal with smart customers. Some people may say it's not a good business plan. I, I don't care. I really do think that's where we're going. Customers, and you guys are not fooled by this. When Carol's daughter did what she did, and you, you saw it, she started moving away from purely black people to now, oh, we're gonna do ambiguous because we're trying to get the white people. If from the get-go she had been more honest and been more inclusive in a more interesting way, in a way that kind of follows real natural lines, where one day maybe there's a white person because precisely because of this or because of that, not because you're trying to be the Benetton of the world, 
maybe it would have been received differently. So us, what we're doing is we're just trying to be who we are. To the point that sometimes Sharon doesn't even want to go and do some talks because she's like, oh, how's it going to be received? A white person talking about bias. I said, Sharon, you go out there. You know as much about anybody uh, as you know as much as anybody about this. You care as much about as anybody about this. You're working your ass off on this. You go. And we do talk sometimes together, but it's just the way it should be, as far as I'm concerned. So me, I really try to, through our marketing, to do exactly what it is that we do in real life and not try to manufacture some feelings, some, no. We can amplify, but we will not manufacture. And I think brands have gone too far in terms of manufacturing. So that's the best way I can say it. You can amplify what you would like to see, but it has to be taken out from something real. And then you can amplify that, but not go manufacture something over here and try to sell it to people. Because I do think people are smarter than that. I'm not sure if it answers your question. Yeah? I'm racing back and forth. Sorry. <laughs> I seem to pick the wrong spot to stand tonight. <laughs> Enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. Uh, I, my question would be, where, what type of progress do you feel the government, the Sinhalese government is making in trying to change their ways to um, speed up and to just help people be more entrepreneurial so that it can open up the doors for other businesses? That's right. So the, what I want to say is that the people are already entrepreneurial. What's missing is the infrastructure for them to really uh, manifest their talent and express their talent of entrepreneurs. So what the government of Senegal, a little while ago, um, I created a little mini incident, uh, diplomatic incident, uh, somewhere I was giving a talk and the first front row was mm, full of heads of states in Africa. Mine was in there and I knew he was there, I could see him. And I said some of the things I said here. He was furious. He was furious. And, but what else is he going to do? But he did something beautiful. He went back and he said we're going to form, basically they have this task force that's focused now on the doing business. So now Senegal is trying to be one of the best reformers in the doing business. Are we doing better? Yeah. Is it slow? Yeah. But are we going in the right direction? Yeah. And do I think we can speed it up? Yes. And that's why actually now we're, my, we're trying to make sure that everybody really understands what's going on so that they can really uh, now get some extra type of motivation from the people. Because if I can ensure that these women who is 65 years old and lost her child to one of these boats looking for work somewhere. I want for that woman who is grieving her son, day in and day out, for her to understand the visceral relationship between why her son died and the doing business climate of Senegal. A 25-year-old man or woman who is sitting there has no choice, in, no expectations in life, but in the case of this girl to wait for a, a, a husband, or for this guy to be like just drinking tea at the corner, at the corner of uh, the street every day and um, you know, watching, uh, keeping up with a Kardashian on his uh, little smartphone and just being like, and asking me, really, does this type of wealth really exist? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, whoa. And, you, and there you can even imagine, because see, back, at least back then they didn't have that. At least back then, you know, you were in your little world, you're, you're you know, you may, you may live in poverty or whatever, but you know, you, you know, your mind is not thinking that somewhere else may be living so much better. But here now you have a phone in front of you telling you that the rest of the world is not living like that. Even though it's the most extreme case, the Kardashians. So um, that kid, 25 years old, or that woman, 26 years old in her case, never had a job. I want for them to understand the visceral relationship between the fact that they don't have a job, therefore have no hope for a better future, and the doing business cl uh, climate in Senegal. If those guys, I'm talking about women of any age and the youth, if those two groups understood better this, they become a mass that no government, especially in Africa, can ignore. Those are the demographic that make, that make you win or lose an election. Women and the youth. 
If you don't have those two, you go nowhere. But right now, they don't know what's going on. So when an election comes, at least in my country, they're like, oh, we're gonna vote for a president that's gonna reduce the price of, um, you know, um, products of first necessity, like oil, rice, whatever, or the price of rent. What type of government reduces the price of rent? A government that's actually not very business friendly. So follow the trail again. If you're not very business friendly, no business, no jobs, no income, more poverty. But these people are going for something that's totally counter. So, but instead now, if you have really opened their eyes to the real reason why they're where they are and the relationship to be doing business, guess what's gonna happen? At some point, they're gonna be the ones asking for, we wanna be the best reformers on the doing business index because we know that then when we get there, it's gonna translate into more companies, more companies gonna translate into more jobs and more jobs will translate into my child will have a job or me, the young person, is gonna have a job. So we are trying to tackle this from many different angles. So on one end, we're trying to work with uh, you know, some organizations that are working on bringing more economic freedom. So behind the scene, we're working on trying to push for reforms. And now I'm trying to go and push from the front. So if you can activate all of these women and all of these young people to understand what's going on and start making demands, then all of a sudden, the government that was you know, moving slowly like here, because what you have to understand, a lot of these countries, the governments don't even feel like doing anything about it because guess what? If you have somebody, which is the case now, a woman telling me, child, why, why do you think I should care about the doing business? I don't have time for that. It's like uh, something for the, you know, for the multinationals. It's between them, the politicians. That's what, that's what I'm hearing for real. See, if that woman is saying that to me, Imagine what's gonna happen if this so-called president is trying to do something about doing business. Guess what this woman will be like? Oh, what the hell are you doing dealing with things that have nothing to do with my life and nothing to do with, it's not my priority. Reduce the price of rice. I don't have a time for this doing business. Who cares? But now if they understand, now you see all of a sudden how the motivation maybe of a, of a leader of a country is gonna go up because now he knows, he's like, oh, the people are demanding this. If I do it, I'm gonna be a hero. You see, so we're now trying also to bring that. And beyond that, some of us are also trying some very radical things where you're trying to, like uh, in a country like Honduras, for example, because all of these poor countries have r r usually the same problems of lack of economic freedom. So there, what some people are doing is they're trying to, inspired by the model of Dubai, they're trying to go into places where there's almost no one living. So Dubai was 110 acres of land. It's like Sharia law is not very you know, well optimized for business. So it's like, okay, instead of Sharia law, we're gonna have British common law uh, kind of ruling this particular area. So you're thinking about in, a, in an area, designated area of a country, you're deciding that the laws you have, because we talked about it, the laws are so crappy that it doesn't allow for the entrepreneurs to do their work. But you're thinking, okay, it's too long, it takes too long, it's too hard to do the reforms for whatever reason, you have your opponents, whatever it is, and then you're saying, you know what, I'm just gonna import a set of laws. So in this particular place, it's, not, it's gonna have nothing to do with, with uh, the normal laws of Dubai, but you, brought, you imported the best practices. And then that's how Dubai got to um, being one of the top uh, financial, international financial centers of the world. Just a few months ago, they got there and now Abu Dhabi is copying them. Michael has been involved in projects like that. So we are trying, we're trying things. Anywhere from very like um, tiny little steps of really pushing the government from behind the scene to help them bring in reforms to now coming up with uh, awareness campaigns for the population, especially women and youth, to on the side also working on radical solutions of seeing if we can just start brand new, start over on some parts of land where there's almost no one so you're not, you're not um, you know, taking anybody out of the land or anything and seeing if we can create something new and uh, recreate a mini Dubai or something like that. So tons of people are working on this, but the more of you are gonna know about this and the more of you are gonna join part of the solution. So that's what's going on in Senegal right now. We still have a lot to do but still things have not been stagnating. And so you can imagine as more people here know how much more pressure is gonna build up. I would love to see, even when investors now are gonna to try to go to Senegal, what if they came and they said, we are gonna go only to countries that have better, you know, a better doing business you know, um, environment or climate or if you go up higher. What if that money was kind of tied to things like that rather than what it is being tied to right now? So, the more of us are gonna to start to be outraged about this, 
and the more solutions will come and the more pressures will start to push from everywhere that at some point it has no choice but to just start to escalate. So that's the strategy. It's, uh, it takes time, uh, but uh, it's a long game we're playing, but it is, it is, a, it is a doable. Um, sometimes I get discouraged, don't take me wrong, but uh, if, I, um, if I'm willing to keep my eyes on the ball and be willing to look far in the, in the future, uh, I can stay positive. But if I look at sometimes just tomorrow or like in five, two years or even three years, sometimes I get very discouraged. But it is there. Please join me in thanking Magat for being with us this evening. And um, thank you all for coming and listening. Thank you. <laughs>